Regrets. I've had a few. What is a look of regret? I don't know, but we're going to talk about regrets on the Heaven's Metal Video podcast today. <laughs> Regrets. Okay, I've got three regrets that involve football, and then I have a couple that involve music. And uh, so the first, uh, Thursday afternoon practice before Desert played Rosemont. I had just gotten back and recuperated from a lower back injury. Kind of threw my back out. I had a disc that hurts. And I was back in the starting lineup. We were going to play Rosemont, which at the time, 1980, was a pushover opponent. They were just not very good. Sorry, Roseman. Roseman Roadrunners. They uh, went to state a few years after we graduated. But anyway, um, because it was the practice before game, we didn't do any live tackling. And we had these giant blue pads that were about this wide and this, this, this long, this wide, and had straps that went over your forearm. And you were supposed to use those to block people and use those to bump the running back if you tackle them. And I broke through the line and it was chasing Brett Nafziger, number 22, um, our halfback. And I've got a cat paw reaching over right now, trying to disrupt this video. And uh, instead of just tackling him or falling on him, which was against our recommendation, I reached out to tag him with the blue pad. I was close enough to fall on him, close enough to tackle him, but to tag him as he was running, uh, my arm just kept on going. And my right shoulder kind of, I don't think it went out of socket, but it just instantly hurt. And what was weird is I instantly got a fever. When I told the coach I was hurt, the look on his face was like he was, he was crushed. He regret ever knowing me at that point. It looked like a dad that was just like, oh man. Just got back from injury, now you're injured again. So I missed the Roseman game, but what I really regret is uh, not missing that game, but the week after that we played Tehachapi. And Tehachapi had a running back named Mark Ricker. Rumor was he was 19 years old. He would run for 2,000 yards every season. He was a stud. And uh, as a middle linebacker, it would have been my challenge to face him. And now I could never go back and say, hey, I had a chance to face Mark Ricker. And I could measure myself against him. Uh, so I regret that. Another regret is <clears throat> before the paraclete game, after school, um, I was making out with a freshman girl named Sandy. And uh, I was out by the film yearbook committee room. And, uh, you know, I was just a senior. And basically, I regret saying this, basically taking advantage of a, of a cute freshman girl who liked me. And um, thank goodness she had moral morals. And uh, we did not compromise. But we just smooched and made out for like two hours after school let out. And then all of a sudden we said, well, we better go now, go home real quick and get anything I need to go to the football game. We walk out to the parking lot. We hear the, the two school buses were all running and they were packed with the, the cheerleading squad and the boosters and the band and the, the, the football team. And the coach gets out <laughs> when he sees me walking up and he takes me back to the locker room and I get my bag with has my all my pads in it and my helmet walk back to the bus and they didn't tell me this but they basically benched me that game for my my act of being late and causing the whole team to be late I think it, I don't know how late maybe five or ten minutes but they were all there ready to go and you know, Van Pelt's not here and had to wait for me and my dad uh, was living in Alabama at the time he was stationed in uh, Alabama at the Air War College and he flew out that weekend for some Air Force business and to see me play. I didn't play that game because I was suspended for doing something stupid. And uh, so I regret that. Um, I have a regret when I was on the University of Texas Longhorns football team. I was on the team for one day. I got a chance to walk on as a kicker. And uh, the day I went out there, they had issued me my uniform, helmet, jersey, everything. As, as well as these artificial turf shoes and the soles on those things were about, you know, this almost two inches thick. I remember they were just enormous. But when I saw those shoes, I was like, oh, I could hear angels singing. I, I wanted to wear these shoes, but I thought, you know what? The sole is so high, my trajectory of my foot may be way off. And I don't know if I should do that. If I wear my cleats, I might slip and slide around on the artificial turf, which shouldn't have been a consideration because I'd, I'd kicked there before in the previous spring. 
So I went out there with my artificial turf shoes when it was my time to kick. And I looked at the other two kickers that were there. Uh, the, the starting kicker, Raul Allegre, who was an All-American, went to the pros, kicked for the New England Patriots after college. He was taking a test that day. So it was just me and two other walk-on kickers that were at practice that day. I couldn't get the ball off the ground. And uh, when I looked at their shoes and I realized they were wearing cleats, like their, their kicking shoes, I realized I should go back in the locker room now and change. But if they call my name, they blow whistles at every different um, set they do through a practice. If they call me and I'm not there, then you know I'll get cut or something. So I tried kicking with the shoes on, couldn't do it at all. And then <clears throat> at the end of practice, Coach Fred Akers said, "Everybody come out here and put one knee on the football field." You know, we were all around Coach Fred Akers, and Texas was ranked number two in the nation at that point in time, which was like the summer right before the season was about to start. And uh, he said, "Half the athletes in this nation would give their left nut to have one knee on this field right now." And I looked around going, hey, I got my knee on this field right now. Half the athletes in the nation are jealous of me right now. And by nut, they meant like a mechanical thing that fits onto a bolt. It wasn't a, a derogatory term for a male body part. I, I deny that right out. Anyway, um, they had um, the tall guy, uh, walk-on kicker, try to do it. They wanted to do a, a kickoff return on the field that was from the... The, the kicker's perspective right corner or the return man's perspective the left corner he wanted the ball kicked over there and this kicker kept kicking it straight and after about two or three failed attempts he goes bring me somebody that can kick which was very similar to what he told me at his office about a week before when I had to go and make sure that I could walk on to the team because I was on I was just getting off scholastic probation because my grades were kind of bad in my uh, my freshman year of college and he goes come on out and kick so when he said bring me somebody that can kick it was almost like hearing the same thing. And I looked down at the ground, I looked at my shoe, I thought about the fact that when I kick, my kicks always go straight. So for me to kick right, and if I was doing this in a game, I would want to not let the team, opposing team know I was kicking right. So I'd, all these factors, like this would be a difficult kick. And I thought about it and I just hung my head. And then the other walk-on guy just ran around me, kicked it, put it right in the spot. One of the linemen turned to somebody else, he goes, he just made the traveling team. So I regret that. I regret not going back into the locker room when I saw their cleats and changing into my cleats. Um, okay, so what does football have anything to do with music, man? I, I'm sick of your football stories, Doug. You suck. Well, you know, performing on the football field has a lot of parallels to performing in a band. One time my band was rehearsing at the HM Ranch, and we were rehearsing the song Finger, which we re recorded on our last album, Tiny Little Dots. And uh, we, were, we were just sounding tight, and it has like a, a very tight rhythm, kind of a crucified-ish, hey, I'm wearing the hat today, who knew? Crucified-ish riff, little galactic cowboys. And um, anyway, we just stopped on a dime, and, and our guitar player, Mitch's cousin, was like, whoa! And it just the mo that moment, was it, really, it felt really good <clears throat> to be part of a band that was performing, even though it was re rehearsal. And just being so tight and sounding so good, it was just, it was a great moment, it was, which parallels to like doing something cool on the, on the field of sport. Uh, another regret I have is uh, my rating for the Switchfoot, uh, the Beautiful Letdown album review. One of our former interns and a really good, kind of an indie rock snob guy, I thought he's a perfect writer to review this album. He said, the beautiful letdown is, is titled perfectly. I'm not talking about the words the or beautiful. And he compared it to the, the Chin album and the, other, the first album and, and it th didn't live up to his expectations. He explained why he gave it a bad review. And I regret that uh, we, had a edit we had an editor's rank for each of the editors, the managing editor and the editor in chief, which I was. And I gave it a two out of five. Five was like classic perfect and one was like a waste of space and so three was solid four was excellent and two was uh sketchy i think i can't remember what the the actual words were for the the ratings but i gave it a two and you know what i was really influenced by my staff we had a meeting uh before that issue went to press and we talked about that album and one of our interns funny david stagg who ended up buying the magazine from me years later uh, he was like, you know what I think when I hear that album? Gone, gone. He kind of he kind of mocked it, 
and uh, and I let their opinions influence what I honestly would have rated that. And when I was at dinner with Switchfoot, you know, uh, the singer for Switchfoot, you know, looked at the the review and he looked at the ratings. He goes, "Why did you give it a two? And I kind of defended my two, but it really is. Uh, I regret that because I kind of went with the crowd on that one, and then I got called out on it, sort of. But and I regret making that confession right now, <laughs> that bringing this up and telling people years later that, you know, that really wasn't my opinion. I was kind of being swayed by my staff and trying to to be cool. I didn't really operate that way. I didn't do that hardly at all. Um, but it was a changing time of musical styles, and uh, you know, Switchfoot did have a little bit of a happy sound. And uh, I don't know, it was, it was a little commercial, and it was, it's not cool to be commercial in indie rock snob. So I kind of, uh, I regret that. And like I said, I regret mentioning that story right now that I actually confess that to you. Um, I regret not selling the magazine. A guy named, I think his name is Greg Weston. He was a, a very rich investor in Nashville, wanted to form kind of a, a Christian media empire. And he sent Dino Elefante to, out to HM and to spend the day with me and talk to me about <clears throat> selling the magazine. I regret not selling. That was like probably 2008, nine or 10. And uh, shortly after that time, you know, the magazine business, the music business, the US economy all just went down drastically right at the same time. So who knew that, you know, music magazines would almost become obsolete a few years later. Uh, so it's probably good for him that he didn't buy it. But man, I would have got over a million dollars for that sale of the magazine at that time. And that would have been really good. So I regret not selling HM Magazine, um, the fourth offer I got. Um, I don't regret uh, not selling the magazine, the three previous offers I got. One of those offers, uh, I don't regret reserving the back page of HM Magazine for a presentation of the gospel. Uh, one of the potential buyers uh, during one of those three sales that I rejected was, uh, I rejected all four, but the one I don't, the ones I don't regret, um, he said, yeah, one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to turn that back page into a moneymaker. You know, it's one of the highest selling pieces of real estate for advertising in a magazine. And I'm thinking, man, that's, and I came up with a clever phrase that sounds all righteous, you know, to, but uh, it's true. Which is kind of cheesy to say it a little bit because uh, it's kind of like, yeah, do do do. But, uh, you know, somebody paid for that back page. They paid a price that nobody else could match. They paid it with the price of his son. And so, don't regret ever doing that. It was kind of cool to always come up with a message, no matter how um, secular or cool Christian rock got, no matter how far it strayed from ministry and gospel presentation and turn or burn it got, <clears throat> there was always that that biblical themed message on the back page that was we stayed true to till the end, which uh, I don't regret at all. So, regrets, the thing to do uh, is not to take a call when somebody's calling you when you're making a video, because uh, uh, you might regret that. And who was that call? It was an appliance repair place that I just visited, so I don't know why they would be calling me again. Um, Maybe the check I wrote bounced and they're calling me back. I didn't write on my check. I'm just kidding. Um, so regrets. I guess the thing to do uh, when you hear stories like this is, man, that guy has some regrets. Is uh, you know everybody knows not to beat yourself up too much. To don't uh, don't let your regrets define who you are. But the key to avoiding regrets is to be to make the right decision. Um, you know, make make the make the right decisions. Um, I don't regret getting rid of HM Magazine. Like I sold it at the end, um, which is a long story I won't get into, but I uh, sold it for the right reasons. And also at the time, you know, print magazines were, like I said, obsolete. So it was kind of a time to sell in a business sense, but I didn't want to keep doing that magazine anymore. It cost me too much personally. And uh, so, there's some things I don't regret, some things I do regret. So I shared some today. And remember, uh, the great thing about God's grace is it's, uh, it's free and it's available to you when you're a big fat failure. When you've blown it, when you've done something you'll regret later, uh, that grace is available right then and there. So you don't have to beat yourself up 
too much for regrets. What sucks about regrets is that when you have a real regret and you can't change the past, man, that can that can really really hurt. But uh, you got to uh, give yourself some grace. You know, when God forgives you and there's nothing you can do to change something, <clears throat> that's a good thing. To avoid regretful situations is to avoid making the wrong decision. You don't always have all the wisdom of the world to make the right decision. But uh, think about it, sometimes in your gut you really know what the right decision is. And sometimes we don't make it because it's harder. It involves more cost. So, all right, join the discussion. It's good to be back here on the Heaven's Metal Video Podcast and the Sanctuary International Matrix.